name is Alan Offenson, an Offenson PC. Even though I'm mellow in terms of coordinating everything, I tend to be hyper during the uh, presentation. I mean, I kind of like what I do, which is a good thing if, you know, as a lawyer, you know, if you're practicing. Um, I've been teaching this class, like uh, Dan said, for four years. I've taught other like uh, classes of real estate um, over the years as well. You may have seen me in the legal over the years as well because I've been writing a monthly real estate column for I think over 15 years in the, in the legal intelligence or so basically every single month I get to see what the, the judges in you know Pennsylvania um, mostly the Superior Court in Pennsylvania Supreme Court judges write on real estate matters so luckily I get to see everything as it's happening which gives me a wealth of knowledge it helps me with my practice so one of the ones one of the areas of, of law that I do practice um, in particular is real estate in real estate is landlord tenant law so I do both commercial and residential. We're gonna kind of dumb this down because the law, it's the same thing for the most part. The Landlord Tenant Act of 1951 applies, whether it's residential or, or commercial. The only difference is that for the security deposit, you know, the security deposit provision in the Landlord Tenant Act of 1951 does not apply to commercial transactions. So uh, the reason why I like, like Landlord Tenant Law is really common sense. I mean, over, the, over our course of our lifetimes, like I'm sure everyone in this room Let's just raise hands. Had, how many people have rented over the course of a lifetime during a particular portion? So I would expect that almost everyone, um, you know, whether it's you know during college or in law school or just when you're starting out, everyone rents, right? So we can all relate to the fact that there's landlords out there that aren't the greatest, and we can relate because I'm sure there's some people in here who invest in real estate who have tenants who are not the best. Uh, so, and you know, Philadelphia, you know, they have what's called landlord tenant court in the Philadelphia Municipal Court. I treat it almost as like the people's court. It's like, you know, because most of those matters are litigated in the Philadelphia Municipal Court. You know, it tends to be more lax when you have disputes within those courts. Uh, and, you know, it tends to be more emotional. Sometimes the judges will let you litigate. Sometimes the judges will ask, be, want to become a lawyer again and ask the questions. Um, but it's really the due diligence that you do before you get into court. I mean, it's like life in general. You do the due diligence, you know, beforehand, and it makes things easier. Same thing with landlord-tenant court. So the first thing is whenever I have a client, you know, whether it's a, a landlord or a tenant, I, you know, I go over a checklist of things. So if I'm representing a landlord, I represent someone who's trying to buy a property or who's trying to lease a property uh, in terms of buying a property to, to lease, or I, I represent someone who already purchased the property to lease. I say, okay, you want to be a landlord in Philadelphia County. There's a checklist of things that you need to do. First of all, I mean, if you want to do things the right way, and if you, you do want to do things the right way, because God forbid you have to go into landlord tenant court, and you don't do things the right way, that's where you know you get in trouble. So if you're a landlord in Philadelphia County, like what what, what do you have to uh, worry about or what you have to do? Well, first you have to get what's called a commercial activity license, right? You have to you know what they used to call a business privilege license. It sounds bad, so that's what they call a commercial activity license. You know, before when you said the business privilege, the, the privilege of doing business in the city of Philadelphia people didn't get, it didn't, like, most people didn't like that. So anyway, that's a one-time fee. Two, I think it's $250. I think you can get that online, um, and it's pretty simple, right? And then in addition to, it's a one-time fee of $250. So you also get what's called a tax identification number for Philadelphia. So you have those two things. Well, what's the next thing you have to get? It's called a housing inspection license. Some people know it as a rental license, right? So that's a yearly uh, fee. Depends on the amount of units you have. Um, the first time you get a rental license or a housing inspection license, you actually have to physically fill it out and either mail it in or drop it off in, in the basement of the municipal services building where l and is located. As I tell all my clients, I'm sure people who deal with the government or the local government here, I, I make sure everything's handled over. You never know when the city's going to lose something, and this is an important document, so I get that hand delivered. And you know, again, it's like a couple hours in the morning at L and I. All of a sudden, you have a housing inspection license based on the amount of units that are legal for that particular property. So, if I'm representing someone who's looking to purchase a property in Philadelphia, I ask them what the zone because I also do zoning work. You know, what the zoning is for the particular property and what the legal use of the property is. So, I represent a lot of clients where it looks like a triplex, but you know, is it a triplex? You know, if it's not. 
like for instance, like I see a lot of properties that are classified RSA5, which means single family. So you see three meters out there, and you assume that there are it's legal for three meters, and then you get what's called a certification statement from the city of Philadelphia. That's another document you get from L and I. So it's a resale certificate, and it'll say how many legal, how many units are, how what the property is being used as. A lot of times, what I'll see is I get a client come in, a landlord saying. Oh, you know, and this is someone like who hasn't planned. Oh, you know, I did get the housing inspection license, but it only says, and I, and I say, but it only says one unit. You say you have a triplex, and they're like, how is that possible? I don't know. I was like, well, when you purchase your property, like you should have gotten in Philadelphia. There's no such thing as a CO, right? There's no certificate of occupancy. That's just what's called a certification statement. Did you get a certification statement from the seller? Yeah. Did you look at it? Half the people say yes, half say no, depends on how sophisticated they are. But the thing is, is like, I can only get a housing inspection license, and, it, and the housing inspection license will only say the amount of un units that are legal. So when that comes in, it's like, if I'm a tenant and I go into court, and I, and I see the housing inspection license, I'm like, okay, the housing inspection license, which is a prerequisite to filing a complaint in landlord tenant court, like shows there's only one unit. Well, this person should is not here properly because there's two other units, so that the case can get dinged. So again, what I do is to make sure that you know when I'm setting up a landlord, that you know or doing a deal is to make sure that the, the amount of units are correct in there. Because again, we'll talk about like what you have to file with the housing, um, when you, what you have to file. Uh, to become, uh, to, excuse me, what you have to file in court to actually evict someone, and one of them is the housing inspection license. So if the housing inspection license is deficient, then your chances of winning in court have now been reduced. Uh, so you have your commercial activity license, you have your tax ID number, you have your housing inspection license. Okay, great. So now I'm set up as a landlord, technically by the government in Philadelphia. What else do I have to do? Well, if I'm gonna start renting the property, I'm going to have to give, once I do get under agreement with someone for a lease, what's called a certificate of rental suitability. And that's, a, again, a self-serving affidavit that you can get online from the city of Philadelphia. It's, like, it's a certificate of rental suitability. Just like the certification statement, like we don't have a CO. Like in, you know, in some counties, you have a CO, the, the inspector actually goes out and at least checks the outside of the property, if there's anything. Philadelphia, the, the housing inspection license, they don't, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the certification statement, all they do is they want the hundred and something dollars from you, they'll check what's on the public records, and they'll tell you what's violations against the property, but they don't do an affirmative uh, representation. Same thing with the certificate of rental suitability. The certificate of rental suitability, you basically plug your name in, you plug your, your address in, and all it's looking at is, have I signed up for the housing inspection license, and are there any violations against the property? If there are violations against the property, by the way, if there are violations against the property, you can't get a housing uh, inspection license and you can't get a certificate of rental suitability. And that's something we'll talk about in the litigation, but what happens a lot is when the tenant has problems with their landlord, one of the things they'll do, they'll call l and they'll call the Fair Housing Commission, and these are things that are gonna prevent you as a landlord from getting into court in landlord tenant court. But assuming, Everything's good. You have no inspection. You have no violations against the property of record. You have a housing inspection license. You're signed up in the city with a commercial activity license uh, number as well as a tax ID number, and you'll get your certificate of right to sue the building. And under the law, you have to give any tenants that's leased with you within 60 days from the lease inception the, the certificate of right to sue the building, as well as the what's called partners. Uh, or good housing, I think it's called. It's like a handbook that tenants, the landlord's supposed to be the tenant, that says, like, these are all the things that the landlord has to do in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia in particular in maintaining the property, and these, and if you have issues, these are the people they call, right? So, just like the certificate of rental, so the certificate of rental suitability, the housing inspection license, those are documents that you're gonna need in, in order to evict. Uh, we'll talk about, like, one, you can't even file a landlord tenant complaint. Until you have, until you provide that to the court, the other one's an affirmative defense. Um, but you know, in either case, uh, you know those are really important documents to have because if you don't, you're going to potentially not be able to get possession of the property, 
and not be able to collect rent. Because under both of them, if you look at the Philadelphia Code, if you don't have a certificate, if you haven't given the certificate of rental suitability to your tenant, or you haven't, or you don't have a housing inspection license, technically you cannot collect rent from your tenant, right? And you know, the housing inspection license, you can't even file complaints unless you have a housing inspection license. Same thing goes with the um, uh, for possession. You cannot get possession in Philadelphia unless you have an active certificate of rental suitability and a housing inspection license. Now, we'll, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later. The courts, when they used to be like default judgments, as long as you had your housing inspection license, they would say, okay, what do you owe, right? And they would take the landlord's uh, word for that and you know, see a notice of default. Now they actually look at the housing inspection license. So say today is, what's it, October 3rd or 4th, right? Say I'm asking for rent, you know, for July and August and September, right? The, the commissioner will look and we'll go over the whole process, but the commissioner will look and say, wait a minute, Mr. Nalcomson, your client's asking for rent for July, August, and September and going forward, but the housing inspection license that you gave me as part of the complaint only says that he got the housing inspection license when the complaint was filed in September. So you cannot get any rent backwards. So if, say, I got the, the housing inspection license September 1st, you cannot get any rent prior to August 30, uh, prior to September 1st. Now, again, that's something, you know, that's something that you, know, you should be made aware of and your clients should be made aware of because a lot of times clients don't get the housing inspection license because it costs like $50 per unit per year. So they'll say, yeah, I'll get it when I, when I have to file, right? To be able to complaint in landlord tenant court. Now the judges are being a little bit harder on it, saying that I don't care if no one shows up and I don't care if the tenant doesn't make that defense, I'm not going to let you collect rent because you're not a landlord in Philadelphia, you know, for this time period, I'm not going to let you collect rent for that time period. So it's a, it's a really harsh reality uh, for a lot of landlords. So, all right, so say we got the commercial activity license, we got the housing, we got the tax ID number, we got the housing uh, uh, in, inspection uh, license, right? And by the way, the housing inspection license has to be renewed every year. And the first time you do it, like I said, you have to go down to the municipal, you can go, you can mail it, or you can go down to the municipal services building. But when you renew it, you can renew that online. So, like, again, that's an easy thing. You know, if you go on my website, I have some, like, legal alerts, one of them is like uh, an article about like how do you apply for a housing inspection license. You just click on the link. So the easy thing is once you renew, then you don't have to worry about going down to the city and you can just charge online and it makes it a lot easier. All right, so we got the, we got the housing inspection license, we got the commercial activity uh, license, and we got a tax ID number. So now, before we get the certificate of suitability, we got to enter into a lease, right? Now, most leases, you know, or mom and pop leases, which is a little scary because, you know, with the internet nowadays, you just look up residential lease. Well, is that residential lease specific to Philadelphia? Is it even specific to Pennsylvania? Because there's a lot of protections that tenants have specific to each municipality and each state, right? So, but these are the terms that you should really look at when, you know, when you're dealing with, a, you know, a landlord or a tenant, you know, in terms of and that analyzing and dispute. So the first thing is, besides the rent, is when does the lease start, right? So you may have a lease date, but this is when does it start? So say we enter into a lease September 15th. Well, you could say that the beginning date is October 1st, and how does it go? Does it go month to month? Does it go on a yearly basis? Does it go more than a year? You know, you know, those are things that your tenant and your landlord need to think about when they're entering into a lease, right? So it's more than just the rent. I tell people the same thing with agreement of sale. It's more than the purchase price or the sales price. It's the minutia that get people in trouble. So with the lease, okay, I'm paying $1,000 a month in rent. Is it, is it $1,000 a month for a certain period of time and what that period of time is, right? And then not just the starting date, but what's the end date, right? When does the lease actually end, right? You know, is it month to month? and it continues indefinitely until someone says that's it or is it like is it a year and then again it'll it'll go automatically for another year so is you know what is the end date and then does it renew on its own terms or does it expire 
like these are things to think about. I have a lot of situations, I've dealt with situations where tenants like didn't realize that, hey, listen, this, this lease renews for another year. Without, you know, if I don't give notice, I stay there. Unless I give 60 days notice before the expiration of the lease term, I'm going, I'm agreeing to a whole other, like a whole other year. So that's really important for tenants. And I see that's when, when you have issues. Uh, same thing with uh, a landlord. A landlord may want to sell their property. So they may like not realize that the lease automatically renews. So like that's something to, you know, to obviously think about. Then it's like not just the rent, not just the terminal lease, but what else is the responsibility of the parties, right? So we talk about utilities, right? You know, who's responsible for the utilities, right? So gas and water in Philadelphia are lean, technically liens against the property. So if you ever want to refinance your mortgage or you want to sell your property, if your tenant or you don't pay the water bills on time or the gas bills, that becomes a lien against the property. Now in Philadelphia, there is a program for PGW, for residential units, where you can actually get on the program as a landlord and if the gas is not paid by the tenant directly, then that does become a lien. But I, you know, when I talk to clients, again, not so much residential, but even commercial, like, you know, do you want to include the rent? And then, you know, in the rent, do you want to include the utilities? That's something to consider, right? Because how are you controlling the situation? Like, you know, gas and water can really add up, especially during the, um, the winter months, you know, for gas. Like, so are you going to cover that? Because like, if you cover it, you know, most tenants don't care how much they use the heat, right? Or how much water they use. So if they're responsible for it, maybe they'll be more uh, judicious with their use of it. But at the same time, if they just can't afford it, then you're going to owe it anyway. So like, these are some of the things that you would ask your landlord to, to think about. And, and by the way, your tenant to think about as well. Uh, the other items that obviously think about is who's responsible for upkeep and maintenance of the property, right? Like, again, do is there a deductible that's that the tenant is responsible for, for any type of like repairs. And let's just say that the tenant wasn't at fault for any of the damage, right? But maybe they're responsible for certain repairs no matter what, of say like up to the first $100. And then the landlord's responsible for anything thereafter. Or maybe the landlord's no, I'm responsible for anything. Um, so these are some of the things like we'll talk, you know, we'll talk about when we talk about litigation. Those are some of the issues. Um, again, you know, with any contract, it's always good to have legal fees and costs as part of the contract because, again, you know, we're not cheap, right? And a lot, and a lot of times in these residential deals, like you know, the rent's not exorbitant. So even say like a rent that's two thousand dollars, and you're paying me to like evict someone, like if you don't have an attorney's fee provision in there, if you don't have a late fee provision in there, if you don't have like an interest type of provision in there, then all you're getting is what you agreed upon in rent. And that's a big deal because a lot of these landlords are mom and pop landlords, right? They're renting a house, they're renting out a small multifamily like you know, structure. They're paying a mortgage every single month. So if their tenant's not paying, they're coming out of their own pocket to pay. So it's really important to make sure that you add as much fat to the deal if you're a landlord. Okay, so the grounds for eviction in Pennsylvania. So like I said, everything falls under the Landlord-Tenant Act of 1951. It's a 68 PACS 250.101. And by the way, I know that Dan said, like, you know, leave your questions to the end. I find it's a more, like, it, it's a better program when questions are asked. I don't think, that, like, you know, I think it, it helps, it fleshes out a lot of the issues. So feel free to, like, ask any questions. But anyway, the, gra the grounds for eviction, there's three ways for someone to be evicted. Did the lease expire? Did someone breach a lease condition or non-payment of rent, right? So did the lease expire, right? So you don't have the right to stay there forever, right? You know, so if the lease expires from September 30th and I'm paying $1,000 in rent, the tenant doesn't have the right to stay there forever, right? So I can you know, evict them on those grounds, right? Um, breach of a lease condition. Right, so a lot of times, like a lease condition, you know, what if, you know, 
Like who's on the lease, right? The tenant. The tenant, it may say that there are only two people on the lease. What if the tenant gets all these roommates there? Or they have a dog there? Like that's a condition of the lease that's breached. That's another grounds for eviction. And then the third grounds for eviction is the easiest one, not paying the rent. If I'm not paying rent, I'm not paying rent. And I don't have the right to stay there indefinitely if I'm not paying rent, right? So what happens if though, and I'm looking at the landlord's point of view, what happens if I don't, like if, if there's an expiration of the lease, a breach of the, of the lease, or not paying the rent? Well, we can send what's called a notice to quit. Now, if you look at the lease, some leases waive that requirement, right? I don't have to, like, you know, it'll say, I'm, the tenant waives all notice requirements on the Landlord Tenant Act of 1951. As a, I represent both sides. I'm a big believer, especially in Philadelphia, that you give notice an opportunity for the tenant to do right, right? I mean, there are situations where you know, they're really bad tenant and you want them out as quickly as possible. But I think that you give them notice even if you're not required. Sometimes they'll say you're not required to give any notice or you're only required to give a short amount of notice. I think it's really important as a landlord to look like the good person in court because, again, this is Philadelphia tends to be very tenant friendly. The more that you show that you worked with the tenant, the better your odds of, of getting in and out of there as quickly as possible. So, assuming you fall under the Landlord Tenant Act of 1951, if, it, if it's for breach of a condition, um, it's, if it, the lease is a year or more, then you have to give 30 days notice. If it's uh, less than a year, it's breach of, breach of a condition, it's 15 days notice to leave, right? And for non-payment of rent, it's only 10 days, like you can ask them to leave. Now, a lot of times with the, the lease, this is a practice for draftsmanship thing, um, a lease won't say exactly how you notify the tenant of like the notice of to quit, right? Now, as a practice point, I would always put in that you, you know, because there's so many ways to communicate, like email, text, you know, obviously the snail mail, like the old you know, way of doing things. Um, I would, at the very least, have in addition to uh, the snail mail, I would have something where there's an email address. Because I think it's more powerful for a judge when they see that the landlord has, or if there's no requirements for the, for the tenant, like the tenant sends up to the landlord, an email, right? So you're not going to doctor, I mean, you could, but you're not going to doctor an email, right? And there's no question that the, well, it could be, but it's really a, a question that the person received the email, unless there's something really wrong. So if you're communicating electronically, you're showing the judge, listen, the person received it, they didn't ignore it. A lot of times, though, when you're doing snail mail, like I would do first class and certified mail, and maybe even a certificate of mailing, you know, when, when someone sees, I'm sure everyone in their lifetime, just like everyone's rented, everyone's received something with a green card, and you're like, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> so you like, most people don't want to pick that up. It's not Amazon. I didn't get it. I didn't miss my package, right? It's something that someone wants to make sure that you got it. You probably don't want to know what that is, right? Nine times out of ten. So you know, a lot of times they'll ignore the situation, and you'll you you won't have proof that they got. The, they'll just won't get the certified mail, right? That's why I also do first class mail with certificate of mailing. Then you can at least say, hey, listen, I mailed it out. They got it. You know, it's the right address. Whether they opened up the package is not my responsibility. So, but in addition to that, I think email is a good thing. And to be honest, a lot of times, when I'm representing landlords and tenants, people text all the time. You just gotta be professional about it, right? Like I see people on text, you know, you gotta think, and I tell all my clients this, anytime you're sending someone who, you know, you're having a situation with, like something, whether it's in writing, you know, like physically in writing, or an email, or a text, it, it could be an exhibit to, to a litigation matter. Like, set, you know, don't like, like overdo it, but don't sound like an idiot, right? Get the point across that you need. And I think even text messages are a great thing, especially when you're dealing, say if you're a landlord, you're dealing with a problematic tenant and they're saying that there's all these issues with the property. Well, you're, you can, you know, go, you know, you can memorialize things like such as, okay, what time do you want me there? Rather than calling them up, 
because memories fade, and that's being nice. Some people just don't tell the truth. But if you have something in writing saying, "Hey, Your Honor, I like, I told, I texted this person five times, and they just didn't give me any type of like response, or the responses they give gave me was insufficient." So I think putting stuff in writing is really important because um, I find that when people don't, is like when they get in trouble. By the way, the other thing I was thinking about is when you enter into a lease arrangement, the other thing that you should do is take pictures, right? So if you take, if both from a landlord standpoint and from a tenant standpoint, if you take pictures of before and after, it's really important. I've been in, I've been in court so many times, and I've seen situations where I represent the landlords, and you see like this spot on the floor, and the judge is like, well, how do we know that spot wasn't there like when the lease term started. So if I'm representing a landlord, and to be honest, if I'm representing a tenant, I would take pictures of everything. So then in those circumstances, those one out of 10 or one out of whatever circumstances you have an issue, you have from a landlord's perspective and as a tenant's perspective, you have like proof of the before and after. So that was the other thing I was going to do. So does anyone have any questions while we go to the next item? Yes. Uh, question. Well, way back to the beginning when you were talking about the uh, housing inspection license and certificate of uh, rental suitability, yeah. are they part of the statute of 1951? In other words, is that required under the statute itself? Or is no, it's the Philadelphia Code. The Philadelphia Code requires it. Yeah, the Philadelphia Code requires it. So, um, and, when I under, and, and by the way, the housing inspection license, you can't, if you don't have one at the time that you file a complaint, you can't even file and get a hearing date. The certificate of rent of suitability, you can actually file a complaint without a certificate of rent of suitability. I, I include this in the exhibit, assuming my client has it. Um, and if he doesn't, I, I make sure we do it. He has it at least before the hearing, if not before I file the complaint. But now that I talked to Judge Moss, who's in, like kind of the head of the landlord tenant court, he's told me that they're going to change the form where they're going to require the certificate of rent of suitability as part of the complaint package as well shortly. Because I've made the right. argument, I was like, you know, because again, you can't collect rent and you can't get possession if you don't have either, right? So I, I said, Your Honor, that may be the case under a technical reading of the statute, but the court doesn't believe that. Okay, I understand the housing inspection license. You don't let me file a complaint. But if I'm in court right now and you'll let me file in court, why don't you require me to file a certificate of rent of suitability before I file, at, at the time I file the complaint? And by the way, yeah. reading the statute, I also said it only talks about rent not being due. It, it does talk a little bit about possession, but I was like, you know, I've had situations where additional rent is due. That's more of a commercial standard terminology. But like if utilities are due or if there's a breach of the lease, I, I, I try to read it out of that, but he wouldn't go for that. Yes. I, yeah, but this, I mean, I, I would th isn't it your experience that most landlords don't even bother to get the certificate of rental suitability when they when they enter into a new lease. It's, it's the minority people, minority of landlords that would do that. I, I've been renting for 35 years. I never got one yet. Yeah. I never provided it. Maybe I got lucky. I didn't have to evict anybody. So how does the court? How do these judges or the commissioners view that um, in terms of uh, your your uh, ruling on the case? Do they? Are they going to knock out your case completely? They knock it out completely. They're they like, knock it out completely. Completely. Yeah. They'll, make like, re, they'll make you go get it and refile. That's right. They won't. They're, they're, this is pretty. It's pretty standard. Then it's not just one judge. It's the whole. Court. No. And, and by the way, Judge Moss recently wrote an opinion. And like you go on my website, by the way, it has all the opinion, all the the, the the articles I've written over the years, and I keep it up to date. Judge Moss wrote an opinion probably like three or four months ago because there's there was some case law, local case law an opinion on housing inspection licenses and the effect of not having one or having one. And there was a recent case that he wrote about, about the certificate of rent of suitability, applying that same case law and reasoning to it, meaning if you don't have a certificate of rent of suitability, you're in you can't even You can't even proceed. There no, you can't even proceed. Just one final quick question because somebody go over. Is there a fee to get the certificate of rental suitability? No, it is. There's no fee for that. No. And but is, you can get it online. You can get it online if you go on my website. There's. What like is a, your website? 
nahusa.com, my last name. Oh, that's it, okay. That's it. And okay. so there is... You can get it on the website. You can get, you can get, go click a link onto the article. Yeah, I've never, I never, all these years I've never gotten one, I've never provided one. I just don't bother with it. No, you have to. And by the way, I also write a, 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 a column, a real estate column for the Philly Voice, too, and I've written on that, I think I've written on that as well. That'd be okay. Yeah, I'll so... Well, thank you. You're welcome. And, and like, one of the big, uh, who else had a question? Yes. You can file a common place though without those documents. What about? You can file a common place or without those documents. You can file a common place. So yeah, so you can, but you're still going to end up in the same result. You 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 can file a complaint, but the case, but the law is that if you don't at least you know what's in Philadelphia so far, there's no superior. I don't believe there's a superior court case on it. So you know, it's a court of concurrent jurisdiction is arguing these opinions. But the judge are so like the statute says you cannot collect rent, you cannot get possession if you don't have a housing inspection license or a certificate of rental suitability. And that's what the Philadelphia Code says as well. So yeah, I mean I didn't go through that. I think I wrote in my my, my materials. There's two paths to go if you have a landlord tenant uh, a landlord tenant matter. Like you can go to the court of common pleas or you can go to landlord tenant court, right? Like 99 out of 100 times you're going to go over to landlord tenant court. It's a court of unlimited jurisdiction. That means we can sue for one dollar, we can sue for a billion dollars. Now, landlord tenant court doesn't, it's not a court of equity, so they can't make a decision. Like recently I had a situation where I represented a commercial landlord and we indicated that the tenant didn't, um, the tenant didn't exercise their lease option, their five-year lease option on time. I told my clients, hey, listen, <coughs> You know, they can't tell you, um, like there was some also about like if what was fair market rent or something like that. I said, they can, we could file in landlord tenant court to just say, listen, they're out of time, you know, expiration, and they didn't exercise properly. But if it gets down to them saying that we did exercise, they did ex the tenant did exercise properly, they can't determine what the fair market rent is for the next five years. So it's a court of limited jurisdiction and, and equitable matters. They don't have those equitable powers. But they have the same powers as a court of common pleas. They can hear any matter for any dollar amount and then enter a judgment. The reason why most people go to landlord tenant court, you're going to have a hearing within four to six weeks versus potentially upwards of a year, right? And it's a lot cheaper solution, right? I charge a, personally, I charge a flat rate when I'm representing someone in landlord tenant court because it's an administrative filing. I'm not filing a real complaint. And it's, it's, I don't have to prepare as much as if I went to court of common pleas because I have to draft a complaint, there would be discovery, there would be, you know, the rules of civil uh, of evidence. I mean, they apply in both, but it's definitely more relaxed in court of common pleas. So, yes? Uh, I think I'm going to miss something. Commercial activity license. Yeah. Does that give you the tax ID number? I, you know what? I don't go into weeds that much. I don't believe it does. I think you have to, in addition to get the commercial activity license, at that point, then you get a tax ID number. Right. From the same place? Yeah. Uh, I think. I think you could do that. See, the commercial activity license and the tax ID number, you can do online. Uh, business you know, license. What? That's just a business. Yeah, the commercial activity. So it's just like your business, yeah. business Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They used to that's call it, it a business okay. privilege license. Okay. It didn't sound as great, right? Okay. To people. Okay. Yeah, yes. So you were talking about uh, notice to evict. Yeah. Okay, on a similar circumstance uh, at the end of the lease. Uh, but either way, is email in the statute as an obligation or an opportunity? As Sufficient. The tenant's got to provide you with an address. Yeah. Or an address. Yeah. Uh, they give you an email, but not a physical address. Does that meet their uh, requirement of the statute? Well, if a tenant, well, this is what I say all the time anyway. Even with the security deposit, when they leave, you should, if you don't have any other addresses, you're going to use the, the address of the apartment or the house or whatever. So, so first of all, you're always going to send it to the house because hopefully they're there, right? If, if it's you know, if, if, and if and they're not there anymore, you would send it to the house and it would get potentially forwarded. That's why email addresses don't tend to go stale, right? You know, that's why I do email addresses. And the other thing you can do is you can do the post office. The post office you can send, you know, like when you do litigation matters, like you can say to the post office, I'm doing a litigation matter, who's, what's, the last, what's the current address of, of this person? So, so then, <laughs> I'm going to rephrase the question. 
they, they would give it to you, yeah. If, if you're an, an attorney, you, they would, they, it's like a, a request well, you I don't do it much. There's a request for, uh, you used to be able to put underneath, behind, underneath the return address, something like forwarding address request or something. There's, there's regular language here. I mean, is that for yeah. years? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so is that a defense if they don't give you uh, forwarding address to that defense to well, for secure, yeah, it's for security deposit, it is. Like, the 30 days doesn't start, and we'll talk about this later, but the 30 days, and we can go jump around on here, but the 30 days doesn't begin until, like, uh, until they give you a forwarding address, right? So, so an email does not qualify as a forwarding address under the statute? Uh, I haven't looked at the statute that closely. <laughs> but, like, you know, yeah, I mean, you, could, you, could have, you, you can have a situation where they don't want you to know where, like, if they're giving you, a, if they're giving you an email address, like, then you can't give them money, right? <laughs> so, like, so then they're playing games, right? So it's like, there's no, like, and I have a situation with a client where they don't have the forwarding address of this person, and but they want, they want, they, I, he, he wants to sue them because they damage the property a lot. They're like, they won't, he won't, they won't respond. That's why we're going to like, get the, the post office to get a potential additional. But the forwarding address is a requirement. So once you get the forwarding address, then you have to either give the security deposit back or give reasons as to why the security deposit is not given back within 30 days from receiving the forwarding address. And one of the things that I tell tenants to do, and even the landlord, is to make those are great electronic uh, communications that will be a text or an email. Like I'm representing a tenant, and I know I'm dealing with a landlord that, that's like going to keep the security deposit. Not, not in a good way, then I would say, you know, send them a text saying, this is our forwarding address. So then there's no dispute, right? Yes. Is it 30 days um, after they give you the address up they move out? Uh, so what are you saying? So like... What is you the address that said before they actually move out? I, I, I haven't looked at the statute in a while too closely, but like, I, I would do the 30, like, so if, say they gave them the address September 25th and they had to move out by September 30th, same thing, same thing, same thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, so if you think about it logically, right, you can't really tell them how much, you can't say the place is in great condition or in poor condition for 15 days, right? Because, like, I don't have, you haven't given me exclusive possession of the property and done what, you know, it's not empty now. So, if I, again, I haven't looked at the statute closely in a while, I would say it's 30 days from the ladder of then moving out of the space or they give you the forty. That would be so cool. And that's that's all I remember the statute, but I I mean I haven't looked at the email question of it. I haven't looked at the statute in many years. Yeah. It's just mail at the time. Yeah. So what do you mean in terms of what's mail? Like that you have to mail the 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 landlord letter has to be mailed? Yeah. Yeah. Well but at the same time actually it was what address do they have to give you? Oh, what the address ladder of, you right, when they give you the address yeah. or when they move out, and you have to mail to them yeah. something that they have to have given you yeah. the address. Listen, if they give me an email, even if, it, if it's unclear or even if I don't have to do it, as a landlord's attorney, as a landlord, I would definitely say, listen, you owe me money. And I'm, you know, and I would, as just as a precautionary. Yes, you have another question? Oh, yeah, um, the security deposit, you send that back, back by um, return receipt. Yeah. It depends. I mean, listen, the one good thing about checks, yeah. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna open it up. That yeah. one, they'll open yeah. up, right? If they think they're going to get a check, or it's 50-50, they'll do it. <laughs> so I think that one, you don't have to do certified now. So I saw another hand up. Um, we're a lot of Okay, so... We're ready to, um, we're ready to, you know, oh, the other issue potentially, we're talking about the landlord's point of view. What about the tenant's point of view? The tenant actually has rights, right? You know, we, you know what if the, the landlord doesn't keep the place up in good repair? You know, what does the tenant do, right? And there's the, what's called the implied warranty of habitability, right? Was it Pew versus Holmes? says that like you know you have to maintain at least a base level of habitability for the property and if the landlord doesn't give that then the tenant has three options um, they can fix it themselves potentially they can leave what's called constructive eviction 
or they could potentially withhold rent. I mean, those are the three. I don't know if Pupil's Tome says that, but that's the third option is to withhold rent and put it in escrow, right? So first things first, we have to look at the lease. Who's responsible for this? If it's a landlord responsibility, and also the tenant is not fault for causing the issue, then what does the lease say? Does the lease say that I have to give the landlord uh, notice? And even if it doesn't, I always say to the tenant, if you have an issue with the landlord, give them notice. Give them notice even if it's not required. And then under the same circumstances, whether it's text, email, certified mail, first class mail, same thing. You've got to document the file, right? Yes. Another weird thing I run across with that is apparently the tenant files a landlord ten, uh, an LNI complaint. Yeah. That tolls the rent. I don't know if it tolls the rent. Until, okay. until the repair is done. Bell and I come yeah. out and says that there's a violation. Yeah. Well, that's clearly, well, no, because I've had situations where there was a violation and uh, judges have given me rent still. They've given me rent, you know, in situations. You know. Listen, if you call Al and I, they'll find something, right? <laughs> they, they will always find something. So, and, you know, by the way, that's, again, tenants, some tenants will call an L and I because they're just frustrated. They want to pull their hair out, right? Because the landlord won't respond. Some tenants know the game, right? You, like, especially if I, if, if the landlord doesn't have a housing inspection license and I, they haven't given me a certificate of rental suitability, um, as a tenant, the game plan is this: I'm going to stop paying rent. I'm going to call L and I, and then it's going to take three or four months for them to go through L and I to get anything done. And in the meantime, they're not going to be able to sue in landlord tenant court because if they don't have their housing inspection license, you can't get it while you have a, a, a violation. And you can't get a certificate of rental suitability as well. It used to be you could get a certificate, at least a certificate of rental suitability. But now it's changed. So it used to say this is certificate of rental suitability and here are the violations. Now you just can't get it and that's the game plan, right? And then the other thing that tenants do is go to the Fair Housing Commission, right? Because the Fair Housing Commission has concurrent jurisdiction with landlord tenant court. So if you sue, if the tenant sues his first first to the courthouse or to the commission, whatever you want to think about, if the, if the tenant files their complaint before the landlord tenant complaint is filed by the landlord, the, the landlord tenant complaint is held in abeyance until the fair housing commission decides, and that's a couple month process. At least. So that's another game that a lot of tenants play. You know, when I'm saying game. I'm saying there are bad landlords out there, but there are a lot of bad tenants. I mean, it's. It's actually, I mean, you'll see some of my, I tell some of my clients, I'm like, you know, I just, anytime my clients have to deal with a, ten, a bad tenant, I'll, when we sue, I look the tenant up. And then some tenants, you're like, wow, there's like six cases. Didn't you look that person up before you gave them like a lease to take your property? So, I mean, that's also due diligence. Like, you know, just common sense stuff. I don't go into credit. There's stuff like, you can, there's federal law of like what you can do in terms of getting someone's credit and things like that. Um, so anyway, if I'm gonna, you know, so if I'm a tenant, you know, I'm gonna withhold rent. Yes. Hi, I'm Dave. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, why wouldn't we run credit? It's a fair use. Uh, it's a permitted use. If you have somebody that applies, when you have in your application, then you will run the credit before you have permissive use. Why wouldn't you run the credit? Oh, I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm saying is that's not my specialty. Oh, okay. So I'm not gonna give an opinion. I know there are requirements and and allowances to do that. I'm just saying, like, I'm not going to speak about it because I don't have that aptitude to, to tell you guys, like, what you can and cannot do. I agree. I think if you're giving someone a piece of property that's valuable, you should run credit. And, you know, but you have to do it the right way. And I just... I guess as an attorney, I wouldn't give the tools to a client. I would say, this is what you put me on retainer for. If you want me to do it, this is what we'll walk through and do it. But I would certainly be very hesitant to have anybody that's a lay person just say, hey, I can run your credit, you know, in the Equifax and sign up for a user agreement, and then when they screw up, they're going to say, hey, Dave Huber told me I could do it. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree with that. But I, again, I don't usually go into the weeds that much as an attorney with that type of stuff, but I agree. Like, you know, that's one of the things in due diligence. We talked about like making sure you take pictures of, of the unit from a landlord perspective and a tenant perspective. But before you enter into a lease with someone, and by the way, the other thing we didn't talk about is like I do a lot of student housing as well. You know, you know, a lot of times in student housing, you have 
you know, we're all idiots in college, right? You have these you know, college students who are not responsible. Then you have the personal guarantor, the parents as personal guarantors. So when you're representing a landlord with student student housing, quote unquote, you got to make sure you get personal guarantees, right? So like that just makes it a little added layer of sophistication. But that's something that you should focus on. So anyway, let's go. We only have a couple minutes left. Um, Finally, a complaint, right? Again, let's assume you're finally in landlord tenant court. Um, if you're an attorney, you're going to file it electronically. You're going to sign up. It's so easy. It's like plug and play. Who's the, if you're representing, you know, who's the plaintiff? You know, you, you assign your attorney ID number. You then put the defendant's information. How are they going to get served, right? Like, you know, you would use most times Philadelphia writ service because unlike the other options, Philadelphia writ service, they can post on the property. The other ones actually have to physically hand be, it has to be handed to them the complaint. When you're dealing with a dead, you know, you want to make sure that if they are being service, at the very least you have good service by posting. So you're going to do Philadelphia writ service, and then you're going to then you're going to attach the you're going to attach the lease. You're going to attach your notice of default and notice to vacate and, and, and or notice of termination. You're going to um, you're going to attach your housing inspection license. Again, if you have everything together, your certificate of rental suitability, <coughs> along with the partners, um, good uh, the brochure, the, uh, the good partners brochure, if you have the good partners housing, whatever it's called brochure. And as the draftsmanship point, we talked about the certificate of rental suitability. When I have my, I, I created a lease specifically for Philadelphia. I would re highly recommend that if it's if, at the very least have an addendum where the tenant acknowledges that they received the certificate of rental suitability and the brochure and have them initial, just like the lead lease paint disclosure. You know, there's an addendum, they have to acknowledge that they were at least given notice that they could do testing. Same thing with certificate of rental suitability, because memories fade, right? Oh, I never got the certificate of rental suitability. You're like, well, here it is. Here's this check mark in your initials. That's your initials, right? And at the very least, what I would also do on the landlord, when you have a fully executed copy of the lease at the time of the exception of the uh, lease, I would have an email to the tenant, right? So then it's it's in digital form. So if the tenant, a lot, sometimes the landlord loses these things, they lose the certificate of rental suitability. They even like can't find their lease. It's in digital form, and they can always like do a search function in their email. But also the tenant then has a copy, so there's no dispute that they actually had the lease and they were given the lease, the certificate of rental suitability. Even the photographs of the property, you have a checklist. You know, is are there any issues with the property? And the tenant has to sign off. No. So then, when they start talking about, oh, there are all these issues with the with the property at the time. Not only do you have photographic e evidence, but you also have a statement from the tenant saying that there were no issues at the time they signed uh, the lease and, and took possession of the property. So you have the certificate of suitability. Then, if the utilities are owed, you're going to obviously do like statements showing how much is owed. Um, then you're going to say, well, why am I evicting? Well, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is a pay to stay place. So if, if the mere reason for the default is for non-payment of rent, then if they pay the rent or whatever is due just before the landlord tenant officer comes, then they get to stay. So it's always good if you're representing a landlord uh, that. You find, if not fine, but like if there is a, a, a breach of the lease, that you put that as a condition of the eviction complaint as well, because you can't cure a, a material breach of the lease. So if the, if the judge finds that not only is the eviction appropriate because money's owed, but because there was a condition that was not met, then that's that's not something that they can cure, and you're going to get the possession no matter if they paid whatever. So. Um, Complaint then, you know, assuming the complaint's filed, you know, properly, the, the tenant will get it, you know, by you know the landlord tenant officer coming there and through Philadelphia writ service, and you know you have a hearing probably four to six weeks later, right? Um, if there's any counter claims, continuances or such, they have to be made at least ten days before the hearing date, um, or you know you're going to have to. You can make oral uh, counterclaims of up to two thousand dollars, I believe. And if you want a continuance within that ten-day period, you have to show up. You show up the day of the hearing. Um, you know, you show up the day of the hearing. There's a big room. 
like you know, it's uh, like here we're doing six for the most part. Um, but you know, at the t at, you know, say 20 minutes after the d the time that you were given for the hearing, the commissioner comes out. There's an attorney list. You sign in if you're an attorney. They'll call the attorneys first with their cases. The commissioner, if the if the tenant's not represented, will give them the the parties the option to have a mediator. There's court you know appointed mediators there where they can try to work things out. Or if you can't, or if, if the parties are represented by counsel, you know both parties, you can try to work it out you know amongst yourselves as well. If the parties can't work it out amongst themselves, you know they try to get on the hearing list. The judge comes out like an hour after, after the, the you know say it's an 8:45 listing, and he comes at, he or she comes out at 9:45, and the person and the judge hears the case. And all judges are different. I mean, the good thing I would have to say is that the judges in Philadelphia Municipal Court have improved dramatically from the time that I practice law. I'm not that old, but like I've been practicing since 2000. The judges back then, like, you know, it was just like, whoa, you know, there was just craziness. And I mean, there's still judges out there in the municipal court who I feel like they want to be on TV. Like Judge Judy, they'll start, like, you know, screaming and saying ridiculous things and not letting the attorneys practice law and coming up with, you know, it's okay to come up with ridiculous decisions once in a while. But when you're ignorant, that's a bad thing, especially, you know, if you have clients. So, uh, but you know, most of the judges are good nowadays. They really do try to uh, keep, uh, like, have a consistent ruling. So we're talking about the certificate of rental suitability. They really do all they hold the same rulings because it would be bad if oh, I'm in front of Judge X. Uh, he, he or she doesn't care about the certificate of rental suitability. Then it's, it would be hit or miss, right? So they really are consistent about their rulings. So, assuming there's a judgment for money or for possession for residential matters, you have like 10 days to appeal the decision for the Court of Common Pleas. If it's not appealed, then you can obviously then go through the uh, execution process. Like again, there's a sheriff of Philadelphia County, but the sheriff of Philadelphia County does not deal with landlord-tenant matters. The landlord-tenant officer does. Uh, it's a measurements office. I think he's on 11th or 12th Street around here. And you know, first thing you file is a writ for possession. You know, so much time goes by, you file for the alias writ. At the time you get the alias writ, you know, you'll get a call by like two or three weeks out saying this is the time for the eviction. You'll have your, your locksmith there and, you know, then you'll have your tenant evicted. So, and, you know, if you look at my website, they, they did change the law about like, you know, responsibility of the landlords uh, to hold personal items because that's a big deal, right? So say you evict someone and you, you lock them out, like what happens to what happens to their personal property? So it's like you know there are it's like there's a statute on it now. So again, <clears throat> between my voice and us running out of time, I figure I'd take a couple more questions. But you can really go on my website. I have like probably 125 articles on real estate law. So yes, and do you hold property? Yeah, commercial and residential. Or just residential? I think it's just residential. <laughs> You mentioned, are, are there commissioners who decide these cases in regular tenant court other than uh, judges? I mean, I've been there once or twice, and doesn't the commissioner come out before the judge comes out? He does, and I was kind so, of gloss over that. So the commissioner yeah. comes out, calls the list, right? So say, like, there is no tenant, right? Then I will get a default judgment. But they'll go over the stuff, making sure the housing inspection license, like that the rent I'm seeking, I, I did have the rent housing inspection license. They may even ask for the certificate of rent or suitability. I haven't, I don't go there all the time either. I probably go once a month now, right? So like, I, I don't know. That's, but the a other, that's a lot. Yeah, the other thing I didn't mention great about landlord tenant court are judgments by agreement. So you can enter in, into a stipulated judgment on the record with someone, so a lot of times, the landlord just wants the space, right? They're like, yeah. this deadbeat's not going to pay me, right? They don't have the month funds. So a lot of times, a judgment by agreement saying, I will give you so much time to leave. So say it's, I would say today's August 3rd or 4th, right? I will give you to August, I mean, uh, October 3rd or 4th. Say I give you to October 31st. I will do a judgment by agreement. I get possession as of today, but you have until October 31st, right? And it would be a zero judgment, right? Or I will say the judgment is whatever you owe me. And I will say that I will satisfy that judgment so long as you move out by October 31st. Then obviously you have to have it through a sweat condition, you know, like, you know, you know, bang things up and stuff like that, and then the security deposit 
different issue that's coming. So, but judgments by agreement are a really good tool for both landlords and tenants. Yes. I see a lot of signs that say rooms for rent. Um, if a landlord has rooms for rent, then do they have to follow the same thing that Running of units. Yes, but apartments. I actually had a call from someone today. So just because someone says rooms for rent, can they? So that's a zoning thing, right? You can, can that be a group home, right? So you deal with a lot of this um, uh, student housing unit. They're renting rooms. So they may be separate leases and they may have a common area, but really they're renting an apartment or a house. And so that's when the landlord gets in trouble too. You know, when they have separate leases where group homes not allowed, right? That's a specific zoning classification. So that's something to, that they should, you know, keep, you have to keep aware if you're representing a tenant, and to be honest, a landlord. Yes? <coughs> what usually happens at the Fair Housing Commission? What happened? What usually happens at the Fair Housing Commission? Uh, that is not landlord friendly. <laughs> so, um, technically, the only thing they can do is fine you, right, up to a certain amount. They can't make, they can't say that no rent is due. They don't have any authority to say no rent is due. They'll make a finding, but they can't say that, that you, as a landlord, waived the rent. So, but it could be used against you. So, yes? Can you say again what that opinion was? You said Judge Moss a few months ago. Oh, uh, you know what? Just go to my website. It's, like I said. I'm just looking on your website. I if you go in the articles, under articles, okay. yeah, All right. yeah. If you go in the articles, like my website, how it works is the front page only gives the last three articles. But if you go onto the publication or what we know or something, I don't think you know. okay. but like it's like you can do a search function. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's it's definitely within the last year, maybe okay. less. It's funny. I actually bump into Judge Moss. He lives in my neighborhood. He actually umpires my uh, sons. Lily games once in a while, so and I'll see him at the Whole Foods, and he's, he always has an opinion. He loves to write, so we always talk. So, I mean, at least he's one of the judges that writes, whether you agree with him or not. And there are times I don't. At least he's, he he tries to explain his rationale in writing, and I think that decision is good because it kind of gives a, a you know a map of like what at least some judges are thinking, right? So the rationale. Now again, it's he's writing as you know. I think there he wrote as a court of common police judge because sometimes some of these judges will be court of common police judges once in a while in these landlords and matters. So it's 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 persuasive authority, but they're not bound by it. Like it's not like a superior court decision or has to be a superior court decision. Yes. As a as an attorney for the landlord, is there a way you can uh, do like a, a judge selection by picking a certain date at a certain time, knowing you're going to get a good judge for the landlord? You know what, I don't know the answer to that because I'm not terrible <laughs> enough. But like I do think that they, they are sporadically go throughout so you can't like pick, oh, Mondays is judge no matter. Yeah, like Tuesdays. you know he's landlord family, you, you yes. can't do it that way. Are there are there judges out there who do sit certain days? They they do it on a weekly basis. Okay, okay. take someone over civil back to permit. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Okay. We're done. Uh, what do you find the position for 